Okay, team, here we are again. College of Southern Idaho, Evergreen Building, and my classroom. Um, so we're gonna <clears throat> look today <clears throat> in our mineral series at the micas. The micas are another family of minerals that have really distinctive properties. It's probably one you're somewhat familiar with, um, but let's just jump right into it and look at some properties of the micas <clears throat> before showing you some specific samples and then how these minerals manifest themselves uh, in rocks. <clears throat> so uh, the micas are kind of a complicated group of minerals chemically. Um, this is probably the simplest way to show this, and I wanna to spend too, time, too much time on this because many of you might not be super interested in it, <clears throat> but they're a silicate uh, mineral group that has uh, you know, either some combination of sodium, uh, potassium, or calcium, along with some combination of magnesium, aluminum, or iron. Um, in general, the lighter colored micas will tend to be uh, the ones with sodium and calcium, and the darker ones will tend to have, or yeah, sodium and, and potassium, excuse me, the darker ones will tend to have calcium, uh, iron, and magnesium. So you can kind of guess the chemistry to some degree based on the color. But again, like I said, there's 37 minerals in this family. I do not know all of them. We're just gonna stick with the more common ones uh, that you tend to see, but it's just know that it's a pretty big family of minerals. And probably the most diagnostic property is this one perfect cleavage plane. Micas have this uh, amazing ability based on the way that the atoms are arranged, uh, the silicate sheets are arranged to form these very shiny, so they have these perfect cleavage planes that reflect the light really well. And then they tend to break and peel into these really thin elastic sheets. Uh, and I'll show you that here in a second. When <clears throat> the mica crystals have enough time to form in sort of a plan view, they'll tend to make hexagons. So they'll have sort of a hexagonal shape when there's enough space for them to form uh, well-shaped or what we sometimes call euhedral crystals. Overall, micas tend to be uh, very much softer than glass, but they may or may not be a little bit harder than your fingernail, depending on exactly what kind of mica you have. So they range from about two and a half, which is about the same hardness as your fingernail, to about three on the most hardness scale. So, uh, but definitely softer than glass. And sometimes they occur as books, basically a whole set of these uh, these sheets of micas just piled on top of each other, kind of look like pages in a book. And so we sometimes refer to them as mica books. And you sometimes see these in a specific type of intrusive igneous rock called uh, pegmatite. <clears throat> so let's look at these two types that we're gonna focus on, and then I'll show you some samples here. So the most common types of micas are muscovite, which is colorless, but when it's in rocks, it might look a little bit more silvery uh, in terms of color. And then there's biotite, which tends to be black to kind of dark brown in color. So this is sometimes called white mica. This is sometimes called black mica, uh, even though those colors don't exactly match. And then again, there's a whole bunch of other micas as well. Uh, there's one called fuchsite, which is green. There's phlogopite, gold brown, lapidolite, which is pink, uh, and a bunch of others. Those are just three somewhat common ones that, that I pick. So let's go ahead and look at, <clears throat> excuse me, our mica crystals. I'm going to set up the tripod again because that seemed to work pretty well uh, last time. Let me tilt it <clears throat> down a little bit, get my little pick here. Um, so here is a great sample of muscovite mica. You can see that perfect cleavage plane right there, just perfectly uh, planar, reflecting the light really well. And again, like all micas, it'll tend to have the ability to um, peel in layers. Let's see if we can, here we go peel off a little section of it there. And then I can even start to peel uh, this away into little sheets as well. So this is a nice mica book. Um, whole set of sheets just kind of stacked on top of each other. Great looking muscovite. You can see how uh, when we get it thin enough, it is more or less colorless. Um, but in these thicker sheets, it tends to be uh, a little bit more silvery. So there's a nice example of muscovite. <clears throat> and then it's sibling biotite, which will tend to be black. Again, that perfect cleavage plane uh, breaks into layers. Let's see if we can, there we go, get some of these layers kind of peeled off here. Um, so biotite mica, uh, there's kind of a thicker, thicker section of it right there. 
Um, you can see sort of some of the layers on the side there as well. And then I brought in some of these other ones as well, just for fun. Here, here's some samples of Fuchsite mica. You can see it doesn't show the cleavage plane quite as well. I think this is a more kind of fine grained one, but you can see uh, the green color and the sheen to it. So that's Fuchsite. Um, Philogopite mica can look a lot like biotite, but it's more of a, a kind of a golden brown, maybe a honey brown uh, as compared to biotite. I think you can kind of see a little bit of a difference in color there. So a little bit lighter colored. Um, yeah, more of a, yeah, I like honey brown. That's kind of a nice uh, term for it. But again, yeah, breaks into sheets, the perfect cleavage plane. Um, and this is my only sample, I did not collect this, of lapidolite. Um, so you can see some of the pink little cleavage planes here on this little face. Let's see if we can zoom in and, yeah, it's a little better there. So you can see some of the pink. So kind of an attractive looking little mica. This is the same. It can also be a little more purple. So if you're seeing a little bit of a color change there, uh, that's well within within reason there. So, uh, so there's a couple different types of mica. And <clears throat> let's look at some rocks then and how this mineral tends to manifest itself uh, in rocks. So briefly, uh, in igneous rocks, we're going to see <clears throat> the micas be very common in our felsic or light colored silica rich intrusive meaning it cools underground it has big crystals rocks it's like granite granite is going to be a a rock type that has a lot of mica in it um, we're going to see it not so much in the extrusive rocks the rocks that erupt from a volcano things like rhyolite or andesite although i do have a sample to show you so it is sometimes found in those rocks but it's a little less common uh, in sedimentary rocks the micas do not have a big role to play the only time for the most part we see micas in sedimentary rocks is when perhaps <clears throat> an intrusive igneous rock like granite weathers, uh, the mica crystals get broken up, get transported. And as long as we're not transporting it too far, those micas will tend to hold up, uh, survive, and then they can get deposited along with other minerals. And then they might form something like a sandstone. And so I do have a couple of sandstones that have a lot of mica in them which implies again that they weren't transported very far. Because again, the implication here is if we transport those minerals, which we know are pretty soft, right? And they not only are soft, but they have this cleavage plane. They have this pre-existing weakness in them that's gonna tend to break them apart. So if they get transported over a considerable distance, they're gonna tend to uh, get pulverized into finer and finer material. Um, and we would expect the more robust and strong minerals like quartz, maybe case bar to, to be the dominant ones there. Um, and then we'll also look at metamorphic rocks <clears throat> where micas are pretty common in the intermediate grade, meaning sort of intermediate range of temperatures and pressures when it comes to metamorphic rocks. Uh, and they're gonna tend to be the most dominant mineral in rocks like schist, which is a mica rich rock and phyllite. The only difference between these two for the most part is the temperatures and pressures involved and in terms of mica is the size of the crystals. The schists are gonna have visible mica crystals, very shiny rocks. The phyllites are gonna have just a little bit of a sheen to them. And if I'm not covering these rocks in enough detail, hang tight. Remember when we finished this series on common minerals, we will turn our attention to specific rocks and go into them in a lot more detail. So if you're not getting sort of the rock component of these minerals, just uh, just hang in there team, we'll, we'll get to some good stuff. Um, okay, back to the tripod and we've got uh, a bunch of <coughs> igneous rocks to look at. Let's start out with this, this beautiful pegmatite. So this is an igneous rock formed where we have either really slow cooling and or uh, fluids involved with the, with the magma as it's, as, it's, as it's cooling. So this has some beautiful, this beautiful large uh, muscovite crystal here. Um, along with uh, ones we've already covered before, the quartz. You can see the big muscovite crystal, some quartz. Uh, there may be a little bit of plage in here as well, um, but that's the dominant mineral. And again, we can see this just beautiful muscovite one. I'm not gonna peel that off. That's just too, too pretty to mess with. So it's a little bit flaky there. Um, similarly, <clears throat> here's another pegmatite. <clears throat> so this one has, um, 
Let's see if we can get it in focus really good here. Let's see. Come on, work with me. It's not focusing as well as I'd like. That's okay. We'll do the best we can. Um, so we have some of the quartz in here. We do have little books. You can see these shiny little sections of muscovite in there. Um, looks like there's a little bit of plaid in here as well, the white material. Another big chunk over here. And then we have these big black crystals. Um, I believe these are tourmaline crystals, which is a, not a mineral we're going to cover, um, but fun nonetheless. And so, again, you can see the big sections of muscovite, the silvery mica, uh, in this sort of pegmatitic granite here. Here's a more typical granite. <clears throat> um, and so, work with the camera. Oh, there we go. That's pretty good. Um, maybe the best thing to do is, let's try this. Apologize for the quick pause here. I'm going to try. I'm not using, there we go. This is better. So now we can see in this granite, we've got a lot of quartz, kind of the, the kind of gray, smoky gray material in here. We've got some plage in here. That's some of the white around the quartz. Um, there's another black mineral in here. We'll, we'll cover some of these later. Some of these are most likely horn blends. Um, but then we get this beautiful biotite crystal right here. And if I rotate it in the light, yeah, you can see it just kind of catch the light right there with that perfect cleavage plane right there in the middle of the frame. Um, boom, right there, there's that perfect cleavage plane. If we rotate it around, <clears throat> we can see another one here. And in both these instances, where's my little pointer? There we go. Uh, you can sort of see the overall hexagonal shape. It's not perfectly formed because it's squished up against some other minerals, but it's crudely forming, uh, if not a hexagon, something that almost looks more circular. That's a, probably a much better hexagon there. So here we have some, some granite with a few nice biotite crystals in it. <clears throat> here is a andesite, <clears throat> excuse me, or it might be a dacite. Let's go with andesite for now. So this is a volcanic rock. Um, we've got really big, beautiful uh, plagioclase crystals. This is a porphyritic texture. Again, we'll get to that later when we look at igneous rocks. Um, but over here, we have a really nice and well-formed hexagonal biotite crystal. And again, if I kind of give it uh, the right little rotation there, we can kind of catch, catch some of the light reflecting off of that, that perfect cleavage plane. There's another really nice one. Uh, up here as well, again with the, the sort of hexagon shape there as well. So not a dominant mineral in the volcanic rocks, but sometimes uh, a secondary mineral uh, or an accessory mineral that we see. So in our, our nice one there. Uh, let's see what else we have. Here's another one, uh, another intrusive igneous rock with a bunch of really beautiful and somewhat obvious biotite, uh, all these beautiful crystals here on this face so the shiny stuff right so and this actually has two you might notice uh these really juicy red minerals those are some garnets so this has some garnet in it as well this uh this granitic rock there's another big garnet right there um not a mineral we're covering right now but pretty cool nonetheless and then finally i have for you this this massive thing this thing's pretty big you can see my hand for reference this is a big a big pegmatite, uh, probably vein material. So this is all quartz, dominated by quartz. But we can see also here uh, around the margins and such, uh, some really nice muscovite crystals, kind of forming these smaller pieces in here. Some of them falling off onto the countertop. Um, yeah, so just really nice muscovite mica in this. This I got from um, uh, in the Albion Mountains uh, near City of Rocks. So in southern Idaho. Just beautiful crystals in here, more muscovite all throughout. Very cool. Okay, the sedimentary rocks. Um, I only have two to show you here. And these two, let's see if we can, hopefully these are both sandstones and hopefully you can see as I kind of rotate it in the light, you might be able to see some of these really fancy shiny pieces here. So um, let's see, there's a nice one right there. These are muscovite mica crystals as well. So this sandstone is presumably derived from uh, a weathered granite, and it shows these really nice, there we go, there's some, a little better face there, reflecting the light. Um, 
with these really nice muscovite mica crystals. So there's some there. All the little sparkly things, kind of silvery looking sparkly things. Uh, the other sample I have is here, and hopefully you can see some of these as well. Again, these little sort of specks and flakes of muscovite mica in this in this sandstone. The metamorphic rocks, <coughs> um, some schists. So schists are going to be metamorphic rocks that very uh, have a nice display of these these mica crystals. So we can see there's some some dark ones in here. So some biotite. This looks like it has both biotite and muscovite in places, and so it's okay for those to occur together. Um, they actually sort of thrive in the same conditions. So a very lovely schist, kind of looks scaly. Maybe that's a good way to describe it. Here is another schist <clears throat> with mostly muscovite uh, forming these little shiny little flecks in here. Um, these two over here <clears throat> are samples of phyllite and phyllite's a little different. So it's more fine grained, but if I rotate it, especially over here by my thumb, you can catch some little reflections of light. It's kind of a sheen to it. And so they're too small <clears throat> to show individually. I don't think the magnification is going to work here, but it does have little bits of mica in it. Uh, here's another piece as well. So you can kind of catch that little bit of a sheen there. And it, again, notice how much smaller the crystals are versus uh, one of these schists like we have here. And then finally, the last one I threw in here just for fun this is actually a quartzite. So if we look at it kind of end on, uh, it's kind of sugary looking. This is all quartz sand that's been fused together. <clears throat> but on these old bedding plane surfaces, there was some mud. And now that mud has been metamorphosed into mica, in this case, muscovite mica. And you can kind of see the reflection there of some of these. This is what's known in Southern Idaho as Oakley stone. Um, so this is a micaceous quartzite. So anytime we get mud, or clay minerals that get metamorphosed, a lot of times they get converted into uh, mica crystals. So either muscovite or biotite. So, um, so there you go. So mica in all of its splendor. Hopefully <clears throat> that was helpful. Next time, I think we'll do uh, a combination of minerals. I think we'll do olivine, hornblende, and augite. We'll look at those briefly because those are really common in igneous rocks. Then I think there's maybe a couple more minerals I want to do, but I think we're getting to the end. I think um, maybe a few more will give you a good uh, working um, uh, set of knowledge to identify some of these minerals and rocks on your own. And then we'll switch over to rocks and that will take some time to get through some of the common rock types. I plan to cover um, a little bit on the rock cycle and, almost how, and also how to identify rocks apart from each other. So like, how do I know my rock's even igneous or how do I know it's metamorphic? So we'll start with some just basics in terms of figuring out what kind of rock you might have. And then we'll get into some, some specific rock types uh, that are pretty common. Uh, so that should be fun. That should get us uh, going through the fall, maybe into the winter as well. So appreciate everyone for watching these and your feedback and comments. And uh, you can always hit the, the donate button uh, on the banner of the YouTube page. Uh, there's a PayPal link there. Any support is uh, welcomed and appreciated, but not required. So have a great day, and we'll see you next time with Minerals with Wilsey.